All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. So recently, Clawhammer Supply put out a video about how to make a big Russian Imperial Stout on their 20 gallon, 240 volt system, which is awesome. But I'm gonna show you how to make it on a 10 gallon, 120 volt system. So watch on for that. If it's your first time here, I just wanna say welcome to the channel. In this channel, I'll normally do a grain to glass style of video, which means you get to see the full development of the beer through the recipe process, the brew, and the fermentation, and then the final tasting, all in a single video. So you get to see uh, the little process details that make a difference in the beer, and uh, how small changes at the beginning can create big changes down the road. If you like that type of thing, please subscribe and also hit the like button. It does make a big difference. All right, so it is currently 15 degrees and snowing outside in New Hampshire, which I feel is awesome weather for brewing. It just brings back memories of those old brewing TV episodes where Michael Dawson is out there sitting out in like, you know, 20 degrees below zero Minnesota weather brewing a freaking barley wine or something. And it's like just steam coming out of everything. And it's just an awesome experience. I'm doing that. So uh, considering I can brew outside with this electric system, since I have an outlet on my porch, I'm gonna continue doing that even to the cold, horrible winter. Uh, so it's currently mid-December right now, and uh, we're getting ready for Christmas, as you can see. Um, but we currently are having a pretty great snowstorm, so I figured I'm going to brew in the middle of that. And we're making a Russian Imperial Stout. Previously made a Wee Heavy with a single infusion mash on the system, and I ran out of uh, mash tun space, essentially, and had to cut some liquid out of it and got some losses out of that. Um, so that was pretty much the max capacity I could do for this uh, particular mash tun in a single mash. Now, what we're going to do here... Uh, is show you a technique to brew a hopefully 10 plus percent ABV Russian Imperial Stout uh, with this actual system here. And that is using a double mash. Uh, and that technique is not necessarily too difficult, just adds a decent amount of time to the brew day, but it will allow you to get peak efficiency out of the system and you'll be able to get a full five gallons of a very strong beer. So I will say this is my first time doing it, and it's definitely my first time doing it on the claw hammer system. So there might be some variables at play here, but I'm interested to see what happens regardless. Essentially, the concept of a double mash just involves taking your grain bill and splitting it right down the middle. For this stout, for example, I have a 23 pound grain bill. Yup, that's correct, 23 pounds. So splitting it down the middle gives me two 11 and a half pound grain bills. So you take your first one, you mash it with your regular stripe water as you would normally. Uh, that gives you a wort of decent gravity. Then you're going to sparge and lauder as normal. And instead of going into your boil, you're going to take your second half of your grain bill and you're going to mash again. But this time, instead of using strike water, you're going to use the wort you just created. Uh, this is also known as a reiterative mash. You might have heard it said that way as well. So as long as you don't mash out the wort from your first step, you won't denature any of the enzymes involved and you'll be able to quickly and effectively mash your second grain bill using the wort you just created. And at that point, you should have a very high gravity wort, and you should be able to go right into your boil from that point. So it's going to be about an extra hour and a half, two hours probably, um, of extra time. And it's not going to be too complicated. It's not like decoction mashing. So, so I'm definitely pretty interested in what's going to happen here. Uh, but by all accounts and purposes, it should work out pretty well. A Russian Imperial Stout is a style that I love to make. Um, it's a definitely a complicated style, and it's a difficult style. Um, but it's well worth the effort because they're almost always amazing when they age for a couple months. And uh, it's really quite a good showcase to show people what you can do with home brewing. Uh, so the Russian Imperial Stout we're making today is loosely based on Dragon's Milk, uh, which is a pretty famous one. And I did swap out some of the caramel crystal malts that are in there for uh, more European style caramel malts. So you'll see that when we get to the recipe section. I think that's just gonna add a little bit more complexity than just your generic Crystal 80 and Crystal 120. So Russian Imperial Stout, a lot of people think it's a Russian beer. It's actually a British beer. It was made, uh, actually evolved out of porters uh, in the late 18th century and uh, was started to be brewed as a stout porter uh, or a strong porter and eventually evolved into the Russian Imperial Stout, which was brewed by a specific brewery um, which is called, uh, I believe, Anchor Brewery. It was shipped directly to the uh, court of Imperial Russia. So the late 18th century is about the reign of Catherine uh, the second. It was brewed so strong and super hoppy uh, because it was an export beer designed for a long voyage. It also had a lot of positive feedback from the Russian courts. Today we're gonna be brewing one of those and it's been a while since I've made one. So I'm definitely excited to kind of revisit the style, uh, especially on the claw hammer system here. All right, so, <laughs> hey. All right, so now we're gonna go into the recipe section if I don't get blown off the porch here. Uh, so, sorry about the background noise again. They're just doing cleanup. I can't really do anything about that right now, so please uh, just bear with me. So for starters, we're gonna use 14 pounds of pale two-row base malt. In this case, I'm using American pale malt. Uh, you can also use British pale malt. Um, so then we're gonna add 
three pounds of Munich malt to that, followed by two pounds of flake barley. The Munich is going to kind of add some malt complexity, and the flake barley is going to add a lot of uh, silky, rich, smooth um, texture. You can also use flaked oats, um, but I think flake barley is kind of specialty made for stouts and porters. Uh, to that, we're adding one pound of Cara Munich malt, one pound of chocolate malt, half a pound of Carafa 3, which is going to give us our roastiness and our color, but in a more gentle way. Uh, I am aiming for more of a sweeter, smoother Russian Imperial Stout as opposed to the roasty, aggressive, bitter kind. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, so I'm swapping out Carafa 3 for roasted barley. We're going to add half a pound of Crystal 80 and half a pound of Crystal 120 and half a pound of Special B to this whole thing. So it's a lot of crystal malts. It's going to be a very high finishing gravity and a lot of different layers of uh, malt complexity in here. I'm going to add one ounce of Warrior at 60 minutes and then one ounce of Northern Brewer at 10 minutes. So that should get us somewhere around 40 IBUs. And then a nice little trick you can use with uh, Imperial Stout sometimes kind of broadens the flavor complexity, it's dry hopping. And so we're going to dry hop that with two ounces of Northern Brewer after primary fermentation is complete. So for yeast, I'm going to try first here, and I'm not going to use an English yeast or an American yeast. I'm going to use Quike. Uh, we're going to use Hornindal Quike to uh, ferment this one with, which um, I've actually heard a lot of good reports on people making stouts with Quike. It should really uh, chew through those sugars very quickly. Quike is very happy in high gravity wort. Um, and it's also not going to be a problem if I don't have a ton of yeast available on standby because you don't need to pitch a lot of quake in order to uh, have a successful fermentation. For water, I'm going to be using a relatively high minerality but balanced water profile. So that's 87 parts per million of calcium, 19 parts per million of magnesium, 54 parts per million of sodium, 114 parts per million of sulfate, 127 parts per million of chloride, and 142 parts per million of bicarbonate to keep the pH in check. So, snow. To get that profile, I started with seven and a half gallons of distilled water. And to that, we're gonna add two grams of gypsum, six grams of epsom, eight grams of calcium chloride, and six grams of baking soda. So for our mash, like I said, we're gonna be using that double mashing technique. Uh, we're gonna hold a temperature of 156 for the entire thing. Mashing in twice, once with water and once with the wort from the first mash. So speaking of which, everything is up to temperature right now and I'm very grateful for this recirculation system because otherwise it would not hold that temperature. It's so cold outside. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get ready to dough in with the first set of grain. Once my strike water had reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with the first half of the grain bill, being sure to stir well to ensure there were no clumps in the mash. Next. I restarted the recirculation and let the mash sit for 90 minutes at about 156 degrees to ensure a complete conversion. After about 5 minutes, I cooled down a sample of wort for a pH measurement and I was pleased to see a pH about 5.2. Once 90 minutes had elapsed, instead of doing a mash out, I kept the temperature steady at 156 degrees, pulled out the grain basket and let it drain for about 15 minutes. Then, I cleaned out the grain basket and mashed into the wort from the first mash with the second half of the grain bill, again letting it rest for about 90 minutes. Out of curiosity, I pulled a sample of wort from the first mash and recorded a measurement of 12 bricks, which is about 1047. Once the second mash had gone for about 90 minutes, I set the temperature of the controller to 168 degrees for the mash out. The reason I didn't mash out after the first mash is because I wanted to avoid denaturing the enzymes active in the wort. If I had done something like that, I would have ended up with a much less effective second mash. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for about 15 minutes and then I pulled the grain basket out again and let it drain for another 15 minutes. However, as soon as I did that, this time I fired up the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on the boil. I pulled a second sample of wort for the official pre-boil gravity reading and recorded a measurement of 21.7 bricks or 1089. Once I reached the boil, I added my bittering charge of one ounce of warrior. I came back with 10 minutes left in the boil to add the 10 minute addition, one ounce of northern brewer. At this time, I also added 5 teaspoons of yeast nutrient, about twice the amount as usual, in order to help the quike ferment properly. I also added 1 pound of dextrose, being sure to stir thoroughly to avoid scorching. 
I decided last minute to add the dextrose as a secret weapon of sorts, since my gravity was not exactly where I wanted it, and it needed a little bit of a boost. After 10 more minutes had elapsed, I killed the boil, and let the naturally cold temperatures chill the wort to about 100 degrees over the course of about 30 minutes. Quake will reliably ferment well at high temperatures, and can handle being pitched at 100 degrees, so this saved me some effort and cleanup time. Since I've been having unreliable refractometer readings with high gravity worts, I elected to use my hydrometer instead, and recorded an original gravity of about 1.100. I transferred the wort to a fermenter, pitched the tablespoon of Hornindel Quake, and left it to ferment. So when I was talking about how to ferment the beer, I uh, shot that clip outside, and once again, turns out that that was actually completely unusable because it was out of focus. So I'm not gonna waste your time on that. Obviously, I should be checking my clips, but it was the end of a very long day, and I was very tired. Um, but anyway, we're gonna recap what I said there, basically. First of all, brewing in a snowstorm, pretty awesome. Uh, Brewing any sort of weather, I think, kind of adds a neat element of, of extra awesomeness uh, to the brew day. And I certainly enjoyed it, even though it did come with some complications. I had to keep the lines constantly recirculating uh, so that they wouldn't freeze. Obviously, it did take a long time to also go from one temperature to a higher temperature, uh, but that's also fine. Um, the double mashing technique honestly worked out phenomenally. And that's a technique that I'm probably going to employ on any beer uh, above 1075 that doesn't have any additional sugar additions in the boil. Uh, it is a fantastic technique and it worked like a charm. Um, so it definitely is a recommended thing if you're running out of mash ton space for large beers like this. Also, I did add the one pound of dextrous at the end. Of course, uh, Beersmith estimated an original gravity of 1120 for this beer, which is obviously way out of the question. You, you tend to lose a ton of efficiency at uh, very high gravities in any system whatsoever. Uh, so I honestly was expecting about 1095 to 1100, but it turns out that wasn't really going to happen. Uh, so I chucked that one pound of dextrose in there just to kind of bring us back to where I wanted us to be, uh, and it did end up working out really well. And that's not really going to be a problem because it's 1 24th the amount of fermentables in the entire beer, uh, so it's not going to really risk drying it out any, and uh, all it does is get you a little bit of extra gravity points there. Uh, and when it comes to the fermentation on this one, it's definitely not simple. I'm going to make it a lot easier on myself by pitching quite, which first of all you can pitch hot at like 90 or to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Second of all you can pitch a very small amount of it and not risk creating uh, fusel alcohols or other bad off flavors that come from, uh, from under pitching yeast in general. Or also they don't react uh, that way to high temperatures as well. However, it's not going to behave like that unless you give it enough nutrient. So that's why I loaded up on nutrient during the boil. So koi could tend to be um, a very, very fast and aggressive fermenter if it's fermented hot, um, but it also will tend to bring out a lot of fruitier flavors. Um, otherwise, it can be a very slow fermenter if you ferment it cold. So I ended up kind of going down the middle uh, and I fermented it at basically room temperature plus the ambient heat of fermentation. So it was about 75 degrees in the fermenter with the quake. So if you don't have quake, you can totally use any other clean neutral ale yeast like a US05. I've made Russian Imperial Stout with the US05 before and it's fantastic. Uh, SO4 is another good one. Any, honestly, any clean neutral American or English ale strain is gonna do fine for you. Just as long as you pitch enough, you're gonna wanna pitch a ton of yeast. So fermentation for this beer, in a nutshell, if you're using Quake, you can be pitching one tablespoon at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit and fermenting ambiently at room temperature for about three weeks uh, for it to complete its fermentation. It will go fast at first, but it's gonna take some time to clean everything up at the end. If you're not using Quake, you're gonna wanna pitch the equivalent of at least two dry yeast packets or a massive starter of uh, liquid yeast, probably three or four liters worth um, of starter. You're gonna to wanna to ferment that cold at first, probably about 65 to 68 degrees, and then gradually over the course of about three weeks, ramp it up to about 70 to 72 degrees to encourage more uh, yeast activity and health and, and to keep them from basically dropping out of solution and becoming tired and uh, giving you an, an incomplete fermentation. In both cases, with whatever yeast you choose, the next step is very important and that is an aging period. Once your primary fermentation is complete, you're gonna wanna rack this into a secondary fermenter of some sort. I'm using a keg, but you can also use a carboy or just another fermenter uh, and you will should be fine. You're gonna wanna probably bulk age this thing. Uh, it makes it a little easier than aging in bottles. Um, and if you have it in a keg like me, once it's ready to go, you can just stick it in your keyser and uh, put it on gas and serve it. Either way, you're gonna wanna let it sit at a temperature slightly cooler than room temperature uh, for at least a month to let all of those harsh flavors and harsh yeast by byproducts kind of mellow out and smooth out over the course of that time. 
Now I'm making it slightly easier on myself by using Quake, which is going to go faster, and I also didn't use a high percentage of roasted malts, but we'll see what happens. I might still need to age this for a while. So after about two and a half months of fermentation, our final gravity is here at about 1026, uh, which is actually kind of dry even for a Russian Imperial Stout, but uh, we are sitting at about 10% ABV on this beer. All right, so it's been a minute. Uh, it's been about three months since brew day. I let this thing ferment out for about two or three weeks in the primary fermenter, and then I decided to let it bulk age uh, in a keg. So primary fermentation appeared to go pretty well. Everything went smoothly and we hit our very close to our final gravity in about two or three weeks. And then I transferred over into a keg to do some bulk aging for the next several months. And now that it's been three months since brew day, I've decided that today is probably a good day to taste this. The flavor's not gonna evolve that much more beyond what it is right now. Some of you may be scratching your heads right now and saying, of course it's going to evolve over the next six to eight months. And that is partially true. However, bear with me, I'm gonna get more into that in the tasting section of this video. All right, so this beer is going to be called The Imposter. Shout out to anybody that's playing Among Us right now. And it comes in at 10% ABV exactly and 43 IBUs. Okay, so for appearance of the beer, it is entirely jet black. <laughs> a very, very black beer with a nice kind of dark tan head to it. Um, head retention is okay. It's not the world's best, but um, it does leave a layer on the surface and it has a decent amount of finer bubbles in it. So believe me, this is actually March in New Hampshire right now, but it is no joke, 40 degrees warmer than it typically is during this time of year. It is 65 out right now, which is awesome. So I am naturally outside. So I'm going to be outside today tasting my big heavy winter beer <laughs> during what feels like a summer day. All right, so now let's go in for aroma. So I'm getting a lot of roast on the aroma. Um, a little bit of a malty sweet kind of aroma. Also getting a little bit of like a um, graham cracker. No sort of hop aroma detectable. No other sort of, no, no whiff of alcohol or anything like that. Next up we're gonna go for mouthfeel. Also this is a lot of Russian Imperial Stout. It's going to mess me up. Mouthfeel is actually a lot lighter than I anticipated it was going to be. Um, despite mashing at a relatively high temperature, there's just not that much mouthfeel relative to the strength of the beer. I was expecting this to be a bit fuller and thicker than it actually is. Even though it is medium, it is sort of a smoother mouthfeel. As you can tell, it's not particularly highly carbonated, um, and that kind of makes it feel a bit creamier and smoother, I think, uh, overall. It doesn't really have any slickness to it, doesn't really have any... Um, rockiness to it or hardness to it really uh it's a very balanced neutral mouthfeel but like i said i would have liked to see something a bit uh fuller bodied for this type of beer all right so now let's go in for flavor now since i'm on the other end of this camera and i'm editing this video i really could honestly lie to you and tell you that this is a fantastic beer um, but it's not, and I'm going to maintain my honesty here. Now, a lot of you guys are probably going to stop watching right now, but I would like you to continue watching because I'm going to break down exactly what's wrong with this thing and how you would fix it if you were the brewer in this case. But first, let's kind of go over what I'm getting out of the flavor. So first of all, this beer is very bitter. It is extremely bitter, which 43 IBUs does not necessarily reflect that. Now, you would say naturally, because this is a Russian Imperial Stout, and it has a lot of roasted acrid grains in it, well, that could be kind of a taste that is associated with young beer. Well, three months later, that taste has subdued. The bitterness I'm getting is actually not from a roast, and I'll get into that in a minute here. The roast that I'm getting is actually rather subdued, believe it or not. Uh, number one, I did not use a large amount of roasted malts. I used more of a chocolate malt, which will fade out a bit faster, as well as Carafa 3, which doesn't have as much husky acridness to it. So I'm getting kind of that classic campfire roast, as well as a little bit of coffee and a little bit of kind of a dark chocolate note. Um, another prominent flavor in there is kind of a burned harsh caramel. 
couple additional things that I'm picking up uh, are chocolate, first of all. And that was kind of the main focus of this particular recipe was to kind of push the, the chocolate notes a little bit further than if I had your standard Russian Imperial style recipe, which is a lot more roasty. And the chocolate notes are coming through quite nicely. In fact, it's kind of like a dark milk chocolate. Um, and it has a little bit of residual sweetness to it, which is a nice balance for that. And uh, overall kind of ends up being a bit, uh, a bit more towards like a cacao nib type of dark chocolate. So a little bit bitter, um, a little bit woody, but overall the chocolate is really coming through. There's not as much coffee as there is chocolate. I'm also getting a little bit of a black tea kind of tannic note as well, um, which is not really planned for. And that's really kind of where the good flavors end. Normally when I have a good Russian Imperial Stout, it has at least a little bit of like a plum and a raisin kind of dark fruit character to it. A little bit of a fruity caramel kind of thing going on. I'm not getting this out of this one at all. Um, it's really just dominated by roast coffee and chocolate and it doesn't have the residual sweetness to back up both of those flavors enough to the level where it's like really delicious. Um, they're there and there is some sweetness to back it up, but it's not as much as I wanted to. So 1026 is the finishing gravity for this beer and it's actually low. <laughs> so this beer was supposed to finish around the 1030s. Uh, residual, I think that would have given enough residual sweetness to really back this up and maybe cover up some of the unpleasant flavors that I'm getting. But because it finished so dry, a lot of that is thrown out the balance. But the real reason I want to break this down is not a great beer, is, is one more flavor. And that is <laughs> sour cherry. There is a prominent, bitter, sour cherry flavor in this beer. And that really only means one thing in my book, and that's infection. Which is a real damn shame. <clears throat> I was really looking forward to this beer, but I noticed something as it was aging. About every single week I would taste this beer just to make sure I could track how the flavor was evolving. And the first week, couple weeks were very harsh, very bitter, that's to be expected. However, after a month or two, those flavors really subdued and this beer started tasting really good. However, there were a little bit of kind of like harsh alcohol notes that needed to age and mellow out a bit longer. However, a couple weeks went by after that and as I was expecting this to get closer to tasting and getting better, I started noticing pressure building up in the keg. And every time I would go to take a sample, um, I'd be looking at probably about 5 to 10 PSI of pressure being produced out of this beer, which was weird. Um, I hit my final gravity, or what I expected to be my final gravity, after two or three weeks, and then it continued to ferment, and it continued to break down uh, some of those proteins a bit more. And I started noticing the body of the beer getting a bit thinner. And I was thinking, okay, maybe there's some diastatic is going on. Well, nope, wasn't that, wasn't Brett. Now, three months later, I'm getting so much more of a sour note out of this beer than it actually had begun with. It's at that point now where there's enough of a balance between the sourness and the acrid roastiness that it is acceptable to drink. I'll give you that, but it's not to that point where that infection is really bad. However, give it a couple weeks and this probably could get pretty sour and pretty nasty. My guess is there is some acetobacter that has made its way into the beer. Um, I did have to open the keg a couple times, and it's possible that I also introduced it while dry hopping the Northern Brewer. I was very hesitant to believe that this is an infection at first because infections are indeed quite rare in home brewing. Most home brewers do enough to really thoroughly sanitize their equipment, and this honestly would be my very first infection I've ever had. Um, which is why I'm still a little hesitant to accept that um, as more of a pride thing than anything else. Uh, but I'm going to let this thing sit in the keg for another month or so and see how it evolves and it continues to age and see if that infection flavor grows or fades. If it fades, it's just meaning that the beer is too young, even at three months, which is possible. If it grows, it means there's an infection for sure. However, due to the fact that nothing I added should give a sour cherry flavor to the level that I'm getting it here, and the fact that it continued to build pressure in the keg over the last couple months and I had to continue to relieve that makes me think that it really is kind of an infection. I think I'm probably gonna have to double down the sanitation practices on the kegging side um, and then thoroughly clean and sanitize everything I own after this video. Sorry for the change in angle here, but my camera was literally overheating in the sunlight in March. Despite the fact that this may or may not actually have an infection, um, there's still some things that I would do to improve the beer itself. And if you're looking for a perfect Russian Imperial Stout recipe, this is honestly not it. So I'm gonna link a video here in the corner to last year's Russian Imperial Stout, which was an absolutely mind-blowingly good stout. Uh, that was not my recipe, that was somebody else's. They had it all figured out. That recipe was amazing and it kicked ass. 
It is kind of an old video, but I absolutely nailed that beer. But back to this one, there's a couple things that I would do differently. First of all, it involves the base malt. Even in a Russian Imperial Stout where you have like five to 10 different malts in the, in the grand bill, uh, the base malt still really matters quite a bit. And in this case, I would actually change this from two row to Maris Otter. I used that in the last one and it, honestly, it just makes a big difference. It gives it a lot more breadiness and a lot more fullness, uh, which is gonna help out a lot with that, some of those missing pieces in this flavor. Secondly, I would either nix the dry hopping or reduce the amount of dry hopping that I used. The Northern Brewer definitely adds a lot of woody character, which is pretty cool. Uh, but at the same time, it can be overdone. And right now it is kind of overdone. It is a little bit more than I would have liked. And it is throwing off the balance of the beer a bit. And it's also possible that I knock the pH out of whack a little bit because when you dry hop, you tend to raise the pH a lot. Um, and that can have an impact on the flavor as well. The next thing I would change is adding more roasted malt. And I would focus more on the chocolate malt, I think, in this recipe than the truly roasted malt. Um, I'd probably increase the chocolate malt by about 50%. And I would still probably replace the Carafa 3 with true roasted barley. That's just me, though. I like a lot more of that kind of true campfire type roast than I do the Carafa 3 type roast. Um, it's going to have a little bit more intensity. It's going to be a lot more aggressively roasty and it's going to require a bit longer of an aging period, but that's just something that you have to decide when you're building this recipe. The last thing I think I would change is adding a lot more flaked barley as well. Um, again, probably another 50% increase. Adding more flaked barley is going to increase the protein content, which is going to A, give a lot better head retention than I currently have, and B, is going to increase the fullness of the body, and that is important for this beer. Uh, like I said earlier, it is kind of feeling a bit thin uh, compared to where it should be, and I think adding a lot more flaked barley and changing up the base malt might be all it needs to, uh, to make it feel a bit fuller body and finishing. Anyway, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope that you learned something, you enjoyed the video. Hit that like button if you did. Subscribe if you want more content like this. I'm trying my best to upload every single week at this point. Um, it's either gonna be a grain to glass video or it's some other shorter informative type of video. However, if you don't wanna wait around that long, I have an Instagram at The Apartment Brewer on Instagram as well as a Patreon, which I'm gonna link up here in the corner where there's a lot of additional ad-free video content if you're interested in that sort of thing. In the description box, I have the complete recipe as brewed on the Claw Hammer Supply 120 volt system. If you have another 120 volt all-in-one system like the Robo Brew or the Grain Father, Anvil Foundry, Mash and Boil, stuff like that, um, this recipe should work with a little tweaking depending on what your grain capacity is and what your efficiencies are. Also in the description box, you'll find a complete list uh, of all of the other home brewing equipment that I use as well as links to Amazon where you can purchase more of those things for yourself if you want to. It's a great way to support this channel if you happen to be in the market for some equipment. Anyway, I'm gonna let this age out probably for another month or so before I decide whether or not to dump it, but I think it's okay for now. So I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.